the intro. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. What up, nerds? Welcome to another chilly episode of Straight Chilling. My name is Bob, and I'll be your host for the evening. This is episode number 192, recorded on Sunday, December 9th, 2018. Tonight, we're going to be discussing the winner of the December poll pick, The Shining. Before we get into the review, let me introduce everyone else on the show. First up, calling in from Santa Barbara, California, Randy Candy G. Landy. That's me. Hi. I don't Come know why it's... Down. I have no idea why I went with that cadence, but hi, how's it going? Hi. You look rested. That's that's an illusion. <laughs> cool. Last but not least, calling in from Seoul, Southern Korea, my boy, Soju. What up? It's your boy, Soju Stains. As <laughs> I've been affectionately referred to, apparently, this weekend. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it because it works on several levels. One is, of course, I was juice stains before when <laughs> I was in Jacksonville, and now I live in Seoul, so it's just Seoul juice stains. You could go that way, or what I think is really the where it spawned from is just a spinoff, so juice stains, which kind yeah. of sounds like soul juice stains, but soul juice. Yeah, either way, it works. I it's one of those things soul. that uh, <laughs> one of, it's one of those things that really needs a breakdown. Thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> it it also could just be my deep, you know, soul, you know, that I that I bring to the cast. So oh it's yeah, probably oh, that. It's, yeah, it probably has something to do with how soulful and deep you are. Uh, tell me again about that uh, Yabo's rule of yours. <laughs> yeah, man's got to have a code, Randy. Man's got to have a code. Yeah. If that code is an extra half star, if there's tits in a movie, then you're <laughs> the deepest man in America, and you're not well, in America. Well, I'm not in America, so. There you go. Gracious. Uh, we got a little bit of housekeeping to tackle real quick. Just a reminder that the January poll pick is posted on Patreon. If you support us at the $5 level or above, you can vote. Uh, you're voting between the Descent Pieces and Scanners. Make sure you uh, you do that before the end of December, uh, January 1st. You won't be able to vote anymore. Um, and also, another reminder, we're doing our 200th episode uh, just in a few weeks, and we're going to have uh, a Q&A section on that episode. So if there's any question that you would like to ask anybody on the show, uh, whether it's regarding horror um, or just anything else, really, um, any burning questions, go ahead and send those in to us. And uh, we'll answer them on episode 200 for you. Can what I send brains? in questions? <laughs> yeah. um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Well, somebody on my ask? behalf, please ask the question why, and uh, we'll try and get to that. <laughs> uh, can someone I... ask, uh, how dare you? Who yeah, do you think yeah. you are? Where do um, you get off? <laughs> where do you get off is the question I want to ask. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, yeah, I think that's it for the housekeeping. Short I wonder how many what is a cooter questions we're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> how much time the, uh, do you have? For I, can't, I can't tell you how many of those questions we get. We, we, we need to do a better that job. That is a legitimate. There's a reason well, no, for that. I know, but I feel like maybe there's a need for like an all cooter episode that we can reference. All maybe we need to. Episode. Maybe we could do like the cooter breakdown or something. <laughs> oh, need to release our findings to the world uh, we gotta do a better job uh, running down the profile each episode quickly um, before before we decide who the cooter is uh, it's our job you know <laughs> our job. it's not easy but somebody's gotta do it 
Uh, gentlemen, let's go ahead and get into what we've been watching this week. Hey, Randy, what you been watching? What have I been watching? So, since yesterday, I have not watched a whole lot because Smash Bros. came out, and I've been giving that a whirl. Did you buy it, Randy? Yeah, yeah. I've, I didn't get to buy the last one because I never went with the the Wii U, but I bought yeah. the Switch, and I've been playing Smash Brothers, and it's a lot of fun. It's immensely difficult to play with just the one Joy-Con controller, though, so I do not recommend uh, that, and I think everybody expected that. So, um, but I've been the playing Joy-Con. Three, that's what they call their controller. It's like the two sides, and you can play them. It's a, I'm not going to go through that whole explanation, but look at it. Hi, but, controller. Um, basically, a, <laughs> the full controller is pretty necessary, I think. And so that's that's been a lot of fun. I, the adventure mode is a lot more robust than uh, in previous versions, so I like that. I always like the adventure mode, so... Yeah, aside from that, what have I been watching? I did watch Rare Exports for the first time, which I brought up on our Slack channel. And I, 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 I've never seen it before, but I have, like, it's been on the back burner every season for like, whatever, like four years, something like that, um, since I first heard about it. And I can't believe how long I waited to watch it because it's pretty, pretty fun. It's a good, good fun, like, cr- like Christmas holiday horror movie. I am very into it. Um, I don't know if it'll be a permanent, like, every year watch or anything like that, but. Yeah, it's fun, and it's t- it's kind of tough to talk about though without like spoiling things. So I don't know. I was trying to explain it to to Becky, but she like in order to like not spoil it for her, I kind of was like, "It's about a kid," and he's like in Finland. Uh, some weird stuff you happens, watch it. and it's then ET. it gets even weirder, <laughs> and then it ends weird too. So there you go. Um, aside from that, oh, I've been rewatching Community. Got Hulu rewatching Community. Nice. It's a lot of fun. Good fucking show. Miss it. Um, aside from that, not a whole lot. Go. Cool. Juice. Soul Juice. What you been watching? Uh, keeping it on the old Christmas season, of course. I popped Krampus in, which uh, <laughs> oh. I feel. Yeah, I feel like I like that movie just as the years keep going. I like it more. It always, I don't know why I know it's coming, but those damn cookies, man, they're just, it doesn't, <laughs> it's the one thing I feel like in that movie that just, yeah, it it's really, the most cartoonish part of the movie by far. It's half and that's, baked. Oh. Uh, mm. Well, because ev- <laughs> everything else, the aesthetic and everything else is so specific and it's like so old school and like even the mask of like the elves and like the way the toys are constructed. It's got this like really like gritty old school like aesthetic look to it. These damn cookies show up and they just look like so ridiculous. <laughs> just like, what the fuck? Why? Why would there be evil gingerbread? Co- like, why is that even a thing? I don't know. Whatever. But. <laughs> Still a fucking great movie. The, like the combination of Trick or Treat and then Krampus coming out, it's just like such a great. I wish that dude would make like more seasonal. I wish that dude would just like go on a bender and make like every fucking season. Where's holiday. my Arbor Day whore? <laughs> sure. That dude kills it, man. Um, and Bad Santa. I watched Bad Santa. Fucking hilarious. That movie like has me busting a gut like every time. Like I just, uh, it's just visceral. I just, think it's fucking hilarious and uh what other chris uh, die hard i watch die hard good good so i'm just splooging out that christmas season you know i just gotta get on it <laughs> gotta get on it gotta get on it trying to work them all through i watched some christmas stuff as well it's all new stuff so i watched Whoa. three new christmas horror movies this week first one is called all the creatures were stirring uh, directed by Rebecca and David Ian McKendry. It's a it's an anthology Christmas joint um, with a, kind of an interesting wraparound. It's like this couple going on a first date and they go to this theater and they're watching uh, with these like short plays, basically. And as the play starts, it like slow, slowly morphs into the short and then it ends and then another like weird play starts and then it morphs into the next short. Yeah, it's kind of a kind of a neat setup. Um, not a big fan of it though. I don't know that I would particularly recommend it. It's pretty low budget. Some of the some of the segments are fine, but it's overall kind of misses 
the mark. There's one with like a murderous reindeer that was pretty sweet. I enjoyed that. <laughs> um, That's the thing, man. Was... Why are anthologies like so prevalent? Like they're always like because there's a lot of people trying to break into the industry, and like a lot of people would rather take their shots broad and scatter shot with a bunch of different directors and try and get something like that than actually fund all a whole movie director, all though. to the same director. I gotcha. I guess oh, it's that like one's a... a, all the same director, really. Yeah, same director. Oh, all yeah. the same They're, director. Well, there's, oh, that's there's a husband and wife co-director. They directed them all, yeah. Oh, okay. That is that is a little little unique, like, right now, I yeah, think. an anthology. Hmm. It's yeah. like a split EP, I guess, in the old music biz. Trying, <laughs> yeah. to, trying to just piggyback down off music style. Uh, <laughs> that's just expensive. You got to split yeah. the bill. I guess so, uh, huh? All I right. also watched a movie called Slay Bells, B E L L E S, directed by Spooky Dan. My boy, Spooky Dan. <laughs> Who the fuck is that? Uh, I don't know. I just fucking love that name. I love that he goes oh. by Spooky Dan. Does it legit <laughs> say directed by Spooky Dan? Yeah. That's what he goes by. <laughs> yeah. So this is... Uh, <laughs> Dude, this I is hope something a... says directed by Soul Juice Dan's one day. Soul Juice is going to be a porn. <laughs> it is a oh porn. Oh, God. <laughs> Cooters, Backdoor Cooters 3. It's going to gonna it. have at least 0.5 on the scale. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> uh Slay Bells was put out uh, by Dread Central Presents, which I've been kind of working through their catalog lately. And it's, I don't know, this movie is like dumb fun. It's about these like three urban explorers. They have like a little YouTube channel. They break into this like um, old kind of theme park that's like Santa's house, basically. It's like, it's all Santa and Christmased up, but it like went out of business. So it's all decrepit and whatnot. And they, they go in there and they find like, Oh shit! Uh, and then uh, oh, that was weird. Yeah, I guess we're fine. <laughs> I don't know. They find this dude who claims to be the real Santa Claus, and then there's a Krampus shows up, and they they fight, and it's all like stylized in this way where it's very uh, the colors are very saturated, and it has these like crazy dubstep music drops that just like happen throughout it. So it's like kind of a wild style but it's it was i had a lot of fun with it um there may or may not be some krampus dick as well yeah yeah that to look forward to minus what? half uh, stars my, but it's a krampus dick mm. uh the last one i watched was <laughs> the, the the uh the newest installment from that into the dark anthology series it's on hulu that i've been talking about yeah they put out a new movie every month and it's like Related to a holiday that happens in that month, so this was obviously is this the, the Donnie one. Darko a ripoff rabbit thing. What? Uh, it's called Puka, and I know what you're talking about. Not really. It, it's nothing like Donnie Darko. There is it's a, this holiday toy release called Puka, and it's this weird doll, and it'll randomly record things that it hears. So if you're just having conversation or if you're talking to it, it'll record things at will, basically, and it'll replay them either in a happy voice or like an angry voice, depending on its mood. Like you never know what it's going to, what mood it's going to be in. So they, they hire this actor to dress up in a puka suit to help like promote the doll as it's coming out. And the suit sort of has that same effect on him. Like he just sort of, his mood just changes against his will. And he kind of like starts freaking out and he starts to lose like a sense of reality. And like, he, he's like blacking out and like missing time. And he doesn't really know like, exactly what he's doing during those moments and i'll have these visions of him murdering people he's not sure if he's really doing it or not um so it's kind of like a psychological thing uh and it starts off it, it feels like it's a very obvious metaphor um and then as the movie goes it spins away from that and becomes something a little bit more than what you think it's gonna be and um i really i like i like it a lot man it's probably my favorite of the three um again this like into the dark series Highly recommend that shit. It's good. Put your eyeballs on it. Sounds like Donnie Darker to me, Bob. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't oh know. Oh my there's, god. There's going to be a bunch of Hot Topic shirts dedicated to this short, or uh, what? What say, do you think? Why not? Dude, I bet Puka. next year they're going to be selling those damn Puka dolls at Hot Topic. You know it. Oh, damn, you know they are. Damn, Puka dolls. You know it. Oh. You know they are. 
They're going to be selling Soul Juice t-shirts in Hot Topic. I hope so. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't enough under the breath. I, you got to like get it just right to get him to get Rob to get under the breath. Just enough. The sweet spot. That one wasn't <laughs> earnest. That was that was more like a joking one, I guess. I don't know. Nuances. That's it. That's all I've been watching. Let's get into the main feature and talk about The Shining with the back of the box. What is on the back of the box? A family heads to an isolated hotel for the winter where an evil spiritual presence influences the father into violence while his psychic son sees horrific forebodings from both past and future. Yeah. Box. From, ni- from 1980, directed by Stanley Kubrick, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, we've all seen this movie before. I know we have. I'm pretty sure we're all going to recommend this one as well. Are you kidding? Am I incorrect? (laughs) This bullshit? This piece of shit? (laughs) This fucking piece of shit. I can't believe they even printed this on a fucking Blu-ray. What's the point? (laughs) Waste of tape. Waste of of digital space. (laughs) Kubrick, he's, he's fucking shit. What a hack. It's fucking shit, dude. Cooper so, yes. will not stand some shit to me, man. I get, I'll get into it after the spoiler drop, but <laughs> that that motherfucker, right. he's he's got my number. He does. <laughs> he's got your number. He's got my number specifically. Oh, do I need your assistance on my new film <laughs> from Beyond the Grave? Did he just call me Sold You? <laughs> huh? Sold You. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, watch this movie. If you haven't seen The Shining, it's 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 obviously a classic. Put your eyeballs on it. Check it out. Three thumbs up here from the Straight Chilling crew. I'm going to drop the spoiler warning, and then we can go ahead and get into it. Gentlemen, start your engines. <laughs> oh, God. Um, so it's a movie. <laughs> it's got a Jack Nicholson in it. And do we need to like spend a lot of time breaking down the the beats of this movie? Like, no, I don't really. I mean, I we can give I'll... a broad. Ju- I mean, just in case there might be like some youngster, fourteen year old, just getting into his horror, you know, with straight away. chilling. You know, <laughs> let me let me get into it with you, uh, youngster. Let Soul Soul Juice lay it out come, for you, real. Come <laughs> by the fire, as the old man Soul Juice stays. <laughs> Sit on my naked lap. (laughs) Bob! Bob's always dropping weird (laughs) kitty shit all the time. (laughs) What? Always? What the fuck are you talking about? Oh, man. If I had a nickel. uh, (laughs) Come by the fire, children, and I'll tell you about a little film called The (laughs) Shit. So I will start by saying that my first exposure to this movie came from Treehouse of Horror. Like years, years in advance. I mean, and I can't ever separate that. If you have ever watched The Simpsons Treehouse of Horrors, the fucking Shining is a classic one. It's The Shining. And it's Bart, you know, obviously Homer is, you know, Jack. And um, fucking Willie is the <laughs> is the groundskeeper or whatever, the, sh- the chef, I guess. Oh, right. This stuff, yeah, and um, that shit is just that is my first exposure. So much of like my early horror exposure came from The Simpsons Treehouse of Horrors. Well, I mean, between those two things, like this, every part of this movie, for the most part, is so deeply known and like ubiquitous. You can reference any singular scene in this movie all the way down to the furry giving a blowjob, and everyone in the room (laughs) will know what you're talking about. Wow. Yeah, like it is hard, especially to in horror fan among horror fans. But like, I, I I can't like the twins in the hallway, the fucking uh, all work and no play, the blood the, elevator, the blood elevator, yeah. fucking like the, the I don't know all that shit. It is the all maze. so so the deep. Here's Johnny, the even though that's America. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, here's Johnny. I would I would argue that here's Johnny is much better known now for this no, movie. Yeah. Johnny Carson with the later generations who didn't grow up with Johnny Carson. Yeah. So, I mean, even down to the freaking the pattern on the carpet, you know. Yeah. 
You can literally yeah. see that pattern on. I have a sweater with that pattern on it. And people are like, hey, it's shining. Blah. <laughs> yeah. Like, get out of here. I wear this for me. No, that's not true. <laughs> I totally elicit those comments. But um, yeah, it's fucking. This is like. This is a cultural milestone. This movie. Like, you, if you haven't seen this movie, you need to stop listening to our dumb assholes and go watch it. Watch it now. If, if only just to be like on top of your shit. Be a part of the world, you fucking loser. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, you uncultured swine. Get your ass in gear, motherfucker. Go watch this, and then Fast and the Furious, and then you're set. <laughs> this, this movie, I first, this this is like one of the classics that I watched, and I didn't like it first. I had to watch this movie like three or four times before I like legitimately can say I enjoyed it for some reason. I don't know. It took you took me a minute to get into it. What? Pretty takes a long time for some people. Oh, cool! Thanks. <laughs> like, kind of like hey, what? Put me on blast. <laughs> <laughs> I um, what for one of the things that I specifically like took out this viewing and was like, okay, I need to ingrain this in my brain because it, the same thing happened when we watched um the OG Suspiria this year too where like you watch a movie for like the first time or even the second time and something like gets ingrained in your mind and i even mentioned it last week i was like god damn the shining so long then i watched it this time and it's only 2 hours and i know it like so well now that it moves actually pretty quick so yeah. the timing actually honestly really doesn't bother me i was like under the impression just like mentally in my mind it's like oh god God damn it's so long that it was like two and a half hours but it's like just under two hours and it's really moves fine for me now the so. one that i watched is just under two and a half hours it is yeah oh i watched on netflix really i don't maybe okay. it's wrong maybe, so maybe i watched the, i so watched long. the 20 hour version but that's just me <laughs> <laughs> no but which which one is yours randy I don't. I didn't look at the timestamp, so I really don't okay. know. But huh. it was on Netflix too, so I'm assuming it's the same as you watch. Okay, yeah. Then uh, Bob's got some special kind of shit. <laughs> He's got the cut that's got like a half hour of Silent Night, Deadly Night mixed into it. <laughs> I think there's only one cut. <laughs> I huh. watched that. I, I would I know there's only one. Huh. Well, I don't know. Mine's definitely because I was specifically looking because like when it started, I was like, oh, it's like 155 or whatever, like just under two. I was like, oh man, I. Like I said, I have this impression that it's so long, but that's I don't. Two and a half I've hours, never had... man. One hundred fifty-five minutes. That's two and a half hours. That? Oh, maybe I was just assuming I it was just an under two. No, but I think no, but I think the way that Netflix is, I think they separate the hour out. I think it's like one right. hour fifty-five minutes, but maybe not. I could be wrong. Either way, the time is easily verifiable and not the sort of thing we need to spend. <laughs> Yeah. Nope. Nope. Either way, it what it like it doesn't bother me at this point anymore. If it, if that was my first impression of it, it's not any longer. I don't have a problem with the pacing of this film anymore. You know, speaking to that, I remember like I don't know. I always loved this movie. I watched it for the first time when I was like thirteen, and maybe maybe earlier. But like all the way through my teens, what I thought about this movie in terms of length is that it's like okay, well, it's a trudge of a first hour or first. Hour like half and then dope shit so you just have to wait it out and that like that is not a thing i think anymore i love the first part of this i love the whole thing like it doesn't work without like separating out components for me as much as it does like as much as it used to it all kind of works so well and blends and i don't know if that's a byproduct of me having seen it so much and focusing all my energy on that last half and now i'm like the first half still feels fresher to me because i'm paying more attention to it i don't know i don't want to go into all the psychology of that but I like it like I just like it a lot more. Every time I see it, I'm more solidified in my liking of it. When people ask me what my favorite horror movie is, typically I'll say this movie because a it's the simpler answer than I don't know. It changes all the time. And B, it's a fucking great movie. And very few people are going to argue with you about it. So, you know, yeah. I don't know. This, this movie holds the fuck up. If nothing else, like I said, it's a cultural milestone. It cracks me up that Stephen King doesn't like this version of it. Like, I, I guess it was too different from his novel, which I haven't read, so I, I can't really get into the specifics of it. But it, I think it's hilarious that it's just like such a renowned film that everybody seems to love except for Stephen King. Well, actually, yeah. 
I can I could spread a little bit, not a lot. I could elaborate on that a little bit. With I have so much trivia, you guys. I'm gonna be bleeding trivia this whole episode. Dude, drop so, some excellent. knowledge, Randy. So there, I have a whole section of trivia that I personally am entitling Stephen King doesn't want to get it, and <laughs> here we go. So uh, he, there are several bits of this, and they're kind of long. So just stay with me and uh, like just jump in whenever. Stephen King was quite disappointed in the final film. While admitting that Stanley Kubrick's visuals were stunning, he said that a, he said that that it was surface and not substance. He often described the film as quote a fancy car without an engine, which is just straight bullshit. Like if you don't watch this movie and see, okay, this is like a man cracking under the pressures of his life and his addiction <laughs> by putting himself in this setting that's potentially supernatural, but maybe just his own fucking breakdown. If you don't want to see you're, you're not, you don't want to see it. You don't want to get it. Stephen King. You don't want to <laughs> get it. Well, and I can understand too. Cause I, I think I've read some of his like critiques, like in the way. And I, the thing is I haven't read the book either. Mm-hmm. Um, but but in watching it, there's a lot of things that go unexplained that I assume are dived like deeper into um, in the book. But I think like the p- overall personality of like Jack is very different, I think, from the impression I've gotten from reading about why Stephen King doesn't like this movie is I think he's more <clears throat> maybe more sympathetic in the book. Like, he's more remorseful, I guess, about some of his past actions and the relationship he has with his wife and his kid. Um, That's the impression I've gotten. So I could understand, like, if it's your book and, like, if people are changing, like, the characters. There's not that many characters to deal with anyways. But, um, like, I mean, I could understand. But this movie, I mean, just in the art form alone, like, if you can't separate that, though, if you can't recognize, like, just the way like the soundtrack is built and the way the shots, I mean like then then I don't know what to tell you because just as a piece of film, whether you think the characters were done correctly or not is like fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I can see why I can see why he would like, obviously you, you have the right to hold your own story to a certain regard. Like, okay, this is my story that they're telling, but he has liked movies with his name on attached to it that are far shittier than this by a mile. Like fucking like he, what is that? Movie with the green, he directed, what is that movie with the fucking green goblin where he was on Coke the whole time? And he actually directed it. Maximum overdrive. Maximum overdrive. He directed a movie while on Coke continuously. And he wants to shit on this movie. Like I understand like this is, I think it's really more of like a professional, like, a professional quarrel between him and Kubrick because Kubrick a gets so much credit for this movie and B is such a big personality in and of himself. And we'll get to his ass like that. I think that they just both had a vision of what this story was saying. And, you know, you think that the author has the first rights of refusal, but uh, Kubrick got to make the movie he wanted to make. He made it like to a T exactly the way he wanted to. So and it's not if it's not the same as the book, who gives a shit? Like you don't hear J.K. Rowling shitting on the shitty Harry Potter movies just because they're not exactly the way she had it. Whoa, Randy! She fucking loves them. I don't like the Harry Potter movies. I think they're dumb. I love the books. (laughs) At at me all you want. I am not listening. But this is like, (laughs) don't at me, bra. I I don't like. I just. For for Stephen King to shit on a movie that is clearly, if it's even if it's not your tale anymore, it's clearly got something going on to actively close your ears and eyes and ignore, like the obvious themes and stuff that are being explored here. That's on you, man. You just don't want to see. You don't want to get it. You don't want to get it. I did hear that. Like he had a problem. Another problem with like Jack Jack's character, where like he's essentially crazy from go like in the like from the beginning of the movie even on the car ride up like to the yeah. to the hotel before they even get there he's just like the way he's talking and like the look he has on his face he already looks insane and he hasn't even like spent a single night in the hotel yet yeah and then like he's he's crazy and he just gets crazier as the movie goes 
Which well, I think that just adds to the discussion of a film. I think it makes it better because, like Randy was saying, like if you want to dissect it, like is it really supernatural? Is it right? Like, just, That's the is central all... conceit of this yeah. movie, but not of the book. The book is very explicit. Yeah, and that's why I can understand. But that's like if like you have like a beef with it, like well, it's not really my story. But still, to not be able to appreciate yeah. the film is ridiculous. I think, <laughs> I think that he has gone on record. I don't have evidence of this, but I feel like I heard that on on record he's softened this opinion quite a bit really yeah like he's like well i just think like i don't remember i don't want to put words in his mouth at this point but i feel like i read something to the effect of like he was like well you know years later looking back i was probably just being protective of my own work or something along those lines which makes perfect sense to me and you know like either way Stephen king like you know what you you got all the clout in the world in terms of storytelling i'm not going to tell you not to have the opinion you have uh, especially of your own work but i just don't feel like based on the opinion that I just read out loud off of this fucking trivia page, I don't think that's based in anything other than personal rancor and not actually the film. Um, that's my own opinion on that. Anyway, so moving on on this, some more stuff about fucking Stephen King. Stephen King said Kubrick's version of Wendy Torrance is one of the most misogynistic characters ever put on film. He said, quote, she's just there to scream and be stupid. Here's, so, here's the thing. Here's the thing about that. Now, I don't completely agree with that, but I have a note specifically, like mm-hmm. I'm taking notes watching this movie. I, dude, I wrote, if that chick was my wife, I'd probably want to kill her too. Like, there's <laughs> something, dude, there's something about this chick that, like, and it's not just this chick, it's this whole movie. This movie, like, pisses me off like on a visceral let like this movie everything about this movie gets under my skin in but in like a fantastic kind of way and it's weird too because i cannot stand space odyssey or whatever 2001 Mm -hmm. i can't watch it i can't fucking watch that movie it's the same kind of thing but in a negative kind of like thing where it gets under my skin and i have to shut it off this movie from the beginning, even when they're doing like the shots of the mountains and his fucking soundtrack, man, it yeah. just like viscerally like angers me. <laughs> like I don't know, or like <laughs> makes me so uncomfortable. It is the most of any film. I this in 2001, it's the most like physical reactions I've ever had to film. And 2001, I have to shut off. And The Shining, like, I just recognize it as brilliance. It's it's this weird thing that I have. But she, her fucking tone, like, the way she screams and, like, says his name, like, Jack, that, it's just, like, it, like, angers me. <laughs> it, like, it's, it's like nails on a chalkboard, like, would make you, like, physically uncomfortable. Like, the tone of her voice, even when she's not screaming, like, I, she's got this, like, little kind of accent I don't, everything about her makes me mad, and it, like it you adds. Don't empathize to, with her? No, all. I do, I do. But okay. at this, at the same time, though, she lets like throughout the whole movie, I kind of get the like misogynistic kind of thing because she essentially just like takes all of his shit, like all even like in the beginning, like he like freaks out and like get the fuck out or whatever, and she's like. Okay, Jack. Like, like she has like no like personality. She has like no nothing to her. Like no kind of swagger. Even the way she fucking no holds, swagger. <laughs> even when she holds a bat, the way she holds a bat drives me insane. Oh my gosh, dude. No, I I know, but it's so. And here's the thing. I know it's ridiculous. It's but I. It's so visceral. I'm just like what. Who holds a bat like that? Like, it's just, I know it's ridiculous. I know it is. But it's a physical reaction. And that I, like, yeah. it's just, it's kind of the same thing with the kid. Like, from the beginning, the kid, like, he's creepy. He's a creepy kid. He's got his little finger friend that he talks to, and he talks in a weird voice. So throughout this whole movie, like, it's Tony. just this... It's just this crazy pack of like characters that like I don't particularly I empathize with her and her situation. But at the same time, I'm just like along for the ride. It's just this wild ride to where I'm not like super sorrowful for her. I don't know. It's it's wild, man. I love this movie, though. (laughs) I think like 
I, I mean, I get what you're saying because yeah, those characters are taken like individually. Some of those things, I could see those things bothering you. The screams and stuff, it like. They're not meant to be a pleasing to the ear, you know. They're not yeah. meant to be anything. They're meant to be get under your skin in some way. Her like quietly accepting your your quote unquote lack of swagger for her. <laughs> I understand what you're saying, but to me it reads, and I think it's supposed to, and I especially think that after writing some of this trivia, that it's supposed to read as fragility, and that's what I take from this movie is like or the story here that Kubrick's put on screen. This is a family that is already in the process of dissolving yeah. because it is a family that is pre- it's it's on the precipice of falling apart because you've got a uh, an alcoholic father who has physically abused a child who is psychologically scarred and impaired and a mother who is only with him at this point you've got to think in order to like out of a sense of duty like it's 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 a, out of a like I don't know what else to do. Like, it's not, Yeah. this is not, she's not a strong personality in her own right. She's not supposed to be. And hence why she's like taking a lot of bullshit. She's somebody who has her own psychological scarring. And this is all like being compounded by the fact they're, they're in a haunted goddamn fucking hotel <laughs> for months. Yeah. And, or maybe not haunted. Maybe it's just accelerating the process of dissolution and his descent and Jack's descent into madness. Maybe he was kind of insane already. Like he, yeah. he's got clearly he, they've all got a facade going in. He's got the facade of, Oh yeah, I just, I don't have any good ideas, but this will do it. Yeah. Oh, this, this will turn me into a great writer. I'll get my big break and not have to be at work at a car wash anymore. And she's like, yeah, of course you will. And I, I'm going to support you. I'm support you. You know, we, we got a job. We can take care of the kid. He's had trouble in school. So we'll, this will be good for all of us. And the kid's just sort of like riding along, trying to cope with psych- being a psychic and not understanding how <laughs> or why he's hearing shit and why there's a little boy that lives in his fucking throat. Um, it's fucking nuts. I, don't know. I know. Exactly. So, like, you got this character of Wendy who's like, all this shit is true. Then they get to the hotel and shit's accelerating for Jack. And for her, she's watching her husband descend into madness, basically, be- become more and more abusive to her and being isolated from him. She's being more and more isolated from her son, who is, she eventually becomes abused under mysterious circumstances in a fucking haunted goddamn hotel. Like, her fragility is tantamount to the whole movie. She's the only person by the end of this movie that we like that I really gravitate towards as a central character, Danny a little bit, but he only really comes into his own, like at the very end when he conceives of one good plan that (laughs) saves the day basically for him. Like before that he had completely descended and lost his personality to this Tony character, like this alternate personality. You think he's got a psychosis, so you can't really attach it. Wendy's the only one that we can attach to. And she's not doing what we want her to do. She's doing what that character would do, yeah. which is support her husband into a fault until yeah. and then like wait way too long to try and get out of there. Like all these things, they make perfect sense within the psychology of that character to me. And I'm not saying that she's like a fuck she's not shaft. She's fucking Wendy Torrance. <laughs> <laughs> like she's not a badass. I- She's swinging a bat that, at her husband, who she loves, yeah. and who she's only supported and only ever been kind to, as he tells her he's going to bash her head in. <laughs> like Shaft has swagger. Well, Shaft and everybody, has... everybody in this movie, like, does an amazing job acting wise. I mean, she, I'm not saying like she does a great job, but it's she, I like understand a little bit. Like she is a pushover, but she's. I still think she's a great character. I think as an actress, she did a great job. I just had like that physical reaction to where it like, and it's it, but it's not just her. It's the way this whole movie is crafted. And I will say that on like, just top of that, like everybody kills it with the acting. I think my favorite scene, this watch around was the gold, like the bar scene, the gold room scene. Yeah. That, that, fuck that scene is Lloyd, that actor, Lloyd, man, fucking Lloyd. Oh, uh, and just White and man's even, burden. even with Grady, <laughs> So much of this Great. film, so or I mean, so much of that scene, I was like, dude, fucking Heath Ledger watched this shit over and over and over for his, for his fucking Joker. You can see so much of it in that scene. Um, I fucking love 
fucking Lloyd. Oh my god. I love just I love it. I, the dialogue. He's just so Jack Nicholson blank. fucking kills it. Like it, his shifts in like tone and mannerisms are like just brilliant to watch. It's mm-hmm. just like mesmerizing Dude, to me. The way that that Nicholson controls his face in this movie is yeah. fucking masterclass shit. He, like everything he does shows a slipping of control. It's insane how good he is in it. And I don't mean that as a pun, but it is <laughs> like it is admirable. Like like just the way he like he, he reacts to things with a slack jawed, like it's like he's on acid all the time at a certain point <laughs> and like. I, I I am in such awe of him, and Lloyd, that actor who plays Lloyd, who I don't know his the actor's name off the top of my head, but he kills it, man. I've never seen somebody portray so much menace with such quiet de- and blank demeanor in my entire life. It's great. Grady has a good does a great job as well. Like uh, the way they, ha- it's really it comes down to a lot of the directing choices for sure. But the directing wouldn't matter if the acting wasn't good. So, I yeah. mean. You can only do so much from one chair on the set, you know. Even that kid like kills it, man, and he's and he's kind of the same way. I mean, he does a good job with acting, but the way they portray the character is that he's a creepy kid. So of course, I sympathize with this kid who's in this hotel and he's psychic, and his dad beats him. Like, yeah, I'm like sympathetic to him, but at the same time, I'm like, that's a fucking creepy kid. So in the same way, I'm like. Yeah, I feel bad for this woman, but at the same time, like she's kind of annoying. Like she is. Yeah. Like, just, and and then I I feel like that's intentional. Yeah. Um, in the it's same intentional, way, yeah. so that you can. So that's how you are supposed to sympathize with Jack. And it's like, oh, I can see how Jack might be annoyed when he gets interrupted, but that's no reason for him to say, "Get the fuck out of no, here." Because yeah, absolutely he not. Ask like, how the day's going. And I feel <laughs> like that makes the tension real. Like from the beginning, even in that car ride scene, you're like this family, like you said, is not okay. And you can feel it. You don't have to be like talked at or whatever to like, know, like, Oh, he doesn't have to say like our, our, our marriage is in shambles. I think this will save it. No, none of that bullshit. It's like, you can feel it in every scene. Like nobody is okay with each other. Nobody's okay with each other and nobody's being honest about it either at all. Yeah. And the scene where, um, Jack, like the kid goes into his bedroom and he's like talking with him, like, Oh, you like it here and stuff like that. Oh, um, it's just so good. It's all so goddamn good. Like when you talk about like in a movie, like versus like exposition, like amazing. feeling something or seeing something like this movie just has it all. You just the tension is so real in every single scene. It's fucking brilliant. It's it really is. Yeah. Do you want me to continue you... down? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, I was just going to talk about uh, something like the. I guess the cinematic choices, like specifically one of the one of the most uh, notable ones, is like the tracking shot um, of like the big wheel just like rolling around throughout the <laughs> hotel. It's like fucking incredible. And then again, like the, heli- the helicopter shot too. We talked about the opening scene a little bit when the family is like actually driving, but like that, it's like so expansive and massive, and it sort of like sets the tone it's like this big wide empty shot that kind of gets you ready to exist in this big empty hotel for the rest of the movie but it's it's like beautiful and sort of ominous at the same time and the score is fantastic as well i don't know it's um the color choices are very intentional as well i don't know yeah that's true i i I think that I think pretty much every shot is laudable in this movie. <laughs> like I don't, I can't think of, except for maybe the shot reverse shot and the interview scene. Some like a couple of those more mundane scenes. Like maybe those are a little bit like the, stayed or a little bit safe, but they are intentionally so because those are safe scenes. Those are scenes that are where we get our groundings, and then you get these big expansive shots of the the Rockies or whatever, and then you get like these fucking amazing shots like following Danny as he rolls along. Then you have all these fucking amazing shots of like, uh, uh, I don't know, like, like running down the hedge maze or zooming into the hedge maze from above as Dan, yeah. as Jack is looking down at a model and then realizing that it is the true hedge maze with Danny and his mom in there. Like shit like that. That's great. That's like, that's, that's fluid storytelling to me. And yeah. like in terms of visuals, does anybody think the shot of the elevator is a little off because all the other shots are so amazing? 
Um, like, I like that shot. Huh? The shot with the blood flowing out of the elevator? Yeah. No, I think that's like pretty iconic. And it's definitely iconic. Hell. It's like... It's not as effective for me. As it's not some centered. Of <laughs> it's yeah. like... Oh, I got you. It's like yeah. to the right. I don't know. It's I've oh, always just kind of like noticed like he has these amazing shots, especially like mm-hmm. we were talking about the carpet and like with the big wheel and stuff, you have these like patterns and stuff. And it's always kind of bothered me a little bit that the shot of the elevator and it might just be how I don't know the, the way they could do it because of the effect. But like it's just like kind of off and it's kind of weird. <laughs> I don't know. Watch There's it again like, and think about that. I have I haven't noticed that, but I was just gonna also like put a pin on that or put put an exclamation point on what I was saying earlier. Every shot in this movie, I think the reason that they're so brilliant is that I think every shot in this movie is accentuating the isolation. And, like every the big expansive rooms, seeing a kid roll down hallway after hallway with no one there, and then suddenly someone's fucking there. Like that's that's just brilliant. Like there, yeah. that's all you have to do is find creative ways to show isolation. This giant, like, high from above shot of the mom and son walking around in a fucking giant hedge maze. Everything is giant. They are tiny. They shit stand no chance against whatever forces of nature happen to be there. It's great. It's great. Um, I could continue talking about Stephen King and his relationship to this movie if you guys want. <laughs> if you got more. Yeah. I definitely got more. There's a, It's an endless wellspring on this shit. So, um, prior to hiring Diane Johnson as his writing partner, Stanley Kubrick rejected a screenplay written by Stephen King. King's script was much more literal adaptation of the novel and was a much more traditional horror film than Kubrick would ultimately make. He was considering hiring Johnson because he admired her novel, The Shadow Knows, but when he found out she was a doctor of gothic studies, he became convinced that she was the person for the job. And it ends there. I don't know what what that entails, why that was appealing to him, but... I mean, I guess just because he was going for sort of like a gothic thing, but I don't know exactly what that would entail in this movie. Mm. Um, also, here's this is interesting. Stephen King was first approached by Stanley Kubrick about making this movie via an, via an early morning cell or not cell phone phone call. England is five hours ahead of Maine in time zones. King suffered from a hangover, shaving, and th- at first thinking of one of his kids was injured, was shocked when his wife told him that Kubrick was really on the phone. King recalled that the first thing Kubrick did was to immediately start talking about how optimistic ghost stories are because they suggest that humans survive death. He said... Huh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Randy, you're totally... Pause for several moments before I finally... Oh, no. Oh, you're good. I think you caught up. How are we you're doing? Back. You're <laughs> back. <laughs> Sorry, that was the ghost. Um, so, start, so, uh, start back at optimistic that, uh, so, about ghost yeah. stories because people survive death. Yeah, because people survive death. And uh, what about hell, King asked him. Kubrick paused for several moments before replying, I don't believe in hell. King replied, (laughs) stating there are people who believe in hell and that they fear it more than death itself. This was tremendously effective in helping Kubrick understanding the feel of the, to understand the feel of the story. So they started out sort of like on opposite sides of some sort of ideological divide, but they definitely met at a few moments, like in a few ways. The problem becomes that Kubrick was far more concerned with, you know, the fragility of humanity than he was with ghosts and specters, which I think works to make this film fucking the icon that it is. Um, it certainly finally, does, because I like that it is more about the fan. Like we said, like it's from, even from those beginning scenes where you're in the car and then when you're in the bedroom and then you're in the office, it's about the family and to question whether or not there are ghosts <laughs> Is kind of, and even some of it, you know, like the shining part of it that the kid is psychic and can call in this guy who really, you know, doesn't do, he shows up to get murdered. (laughs) Yeah. Shows up to bring the cat with him. Yeah. I, yeah. (laughs) I would, exactly. Yeah. I would be fine, honestly, if that wasn't even included. If, you know, it, it, if it ended with the son tricking his dad in, in the maze to leave him to die, you know, and they, you know, survived out their time in the hotel. Like, yeah, I, you know, the supernatural part of this movie, except for the dialogue he has in the bar is, is actually like the lowest on the totem pole for me, because even that you could just drum up to him being crazy. Like even the ending, like, Oh, he was, 
he was the he was here all along or whatever. It's like, yeah, eh, I, it's, I the family and the the craziness lo- of them is what is the most intriguing. Well, that's that's what's most it has to be what's most intriguing because he gives specific breadcrumbs on both sides of that fence. Yeah, the fence side that shows that he's just a crazy person and the side that shows definitively that there are ghosts. There are things that prove both of those. Th- those there's evidence to both of those ends in this movie. There's no way that that was unintentional. So you oh, got to yeah. think that that was that lingering question was supposed to be there in order to accentuate the fact that the the core of the movie is about this family and how fragile they started and how easily they broke apart when tested in any way. Um, also, the idea of I just the idea of him being like, "We're going to be here for five months alone," especially when that woman already like kind of annoys me. Like imagining like <laughs> like having a wife and like knowing and like seeing this woman and like just not even knowing her, but the way she talks like viscerally just like annoys me like i just had this reaction to it i just that i then the uh, idea planted by just saying like we're gonna be here for five months and seeing those expansive hallways and just the tension continually to build you're just like oh my god like that's such a real (laughs) feeling that i feel like we can all imagine like shit like that sucks or like that's tough it's just oh my god, this fucking movie. That's, that's to um <laughs> to close my Stephen King doesn't want to get it section. Um, <laughs> let's talk about how Jack Nicholson was cast. Stephen King tried to talk Stanley Kubrick out of casting Jack Nicholson in the lead, suggesting instead it. either Michael Moriarty, who I don't know, or John Voight. King said he felt that watching either of these normal-looking men gradually descend into madness would have immensely improved the dramatic thrust of the storyline. So, let it be heard known worldwide that Stephen King does not care for Jack Nicholson's fucking face. Um, And that that almost ruined this movie. John Voight is not a good choice. I'm just going to put that out there. (laughs) Thank God Kubrick was like, fuck that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's the thing, man. We always say, you gotta have a no, man. You know, like, yeah. good for Kubrick for just being like, not, like not being a like fanboy, like, oh my God, Stephen King, or you know, trying to be like, like I understand wanting to be respectful with somebody's work, but like sometimes you just gotta do do your thing, you know. You just gotta the be thing like, is, nah, like, nah, bro. That's, <laughs> that's a double edged sword, though, because a lot of directors have been have made that similar decision. Rob Zombie and, and really fuck the pooch on. Well, it. no, Rob Zombie's the guy that needs the no man though. See, he and does. It's, in this, in this, I'm like, I'm comparing. Well, he S- did Stephen King and Rob Zombie would be the same person in this movie, not Kubrick and Rob Zombie. <laughs> Rob no, because he's adapting something that already exists and. But he writes it, though, but he writes he it every time, though. That's the problem. See, Stephen well, King no, has yeah. a, a written attachment to it. He's like, I want to see the way I have these characters in my head fleshed out. And Kubrick's like, nah, like, I got your story. Like, I get it, but I'm going this way. So, like, Rob Zombie needs the note. Rob Zombie's the Stephen King in this, in this scenario. I don't he think so, because he directed the movie that he wrote that was an adaptation of a previous movie the way that... Kubrick was adapting a previous existing book. No, Justin's just saying they both do whatever the fuck they want because nobody can tell them otherwise. That's all he's saying. I, okay, I, I, I can see that. But like, like I don't Rob like, needs someone to wrangle him in. <laughs> what I'm what I'm saying is that fucking Stephen King, like having the original creator or whatever come in and tell you what to do, you can say no to that, but it can have negative results just as quickly as it can yeah. have positive results. And I think by far the negative results outstrip the positive when you strip out certain things from an adaptation. That's one of the perils of adapting anything though. So, Mm. I mean, what are you going to do? The, the fortunate thing about this movie is that it happened at a time when people weren't so precious about the source material and a director, uh, like Kubrick, who obviously had a plenty of clout at the time could get away with, with doing his own thing. The problem with that is that, it can go really wrong really easily. Um, also, just a little side note here. Uh, other actors considered for the role of Jack Torrance. Anybody want to take a, any guesses real quick? You'll be wrong. Um, yeah, no, I'll be wrong. Rob? Fuck it. Okay. Just go All right. It. Christopher Reeve. Hmm. Huh. Martin Sheen. 
Maybe. I could give a maybe to Martin Sheen. Maybe. Leslie Nielsen. Oh, my God. Leslie Nielsen. Leslie Nielsen. From the Naked Her- Gun? Yes. Oh. Yes. And Creepshow? And, and finally, he, and this is... Huh? He is pretty well, creepy in Creepshow. Like, he does a pretty let's... solid job in Creepshow. N- N- Nielsen, honestly, like, I, he's got range, and I honestly would kind of yeah. like to see him do... have done. I wish he had done more things that were, like... I, I would have liked to see him in more horror, I guess, is what I'm getting yeah, at. Yeah, I would, too. But not, like, obviously, it's it's you're comparing an iconic performance to any of these people, so they're all going to look like shit comparatively in our yeah. fantasy version. But here's the coup de grace, which I think is hilariously misguided. Chevy Chase. National Lampoon's Christmas. <laughs> not at all, man. Not Dude, at all. I don't know. Like, part of me wants. To, I mean, no, I want to see no, that no movie but yeah, here. like I like what want... Holiday Road on the soundtrack and shit. I want that fucking. I mean, dude has some solid freakouts. I mean, uh, we know he's got. When they're driving, when they're driving to the hotel, that's what's playing. Huh? And then you got the <laughs> blonde that drives up in the red uh, convertible, and he's all flirting with her. Oh, oh my I want to see that I, fucking movie. I really want to see, see that. that. It would be fucking shining parody. Oh my god! Oh, they wanted him for real, though. Somebody was floating fucking Chevy Chase on that role. I, funny I, mean, fuck. I have a no, man. I can't imagine that relationship between Kubrick and Chevy Chase would have lasted, knowing what I know about both of those men. They would have eaten each other fucking alive. <laughs> Actually, probably Chevy Here's Chase would have gotten Chevy. straight up shot. <laughs> <back>. Um, <laughs> I'll kill you. I'll kill you. <laughs> um, yeah. So let your imagination run wild on that shit. <sighs> That's all I got for Stephen King doesn't want to get it. So that last part was a, an option. Very good. There's so much trivia about this fucking movie. There, you could focus on any part of this movie and talk about it for this our full episode. Yeah. I, I it's, love... Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking about this movie. And so, like we had already talked about, so many of the things that are iconic... And just thinking about how some movies are made now or how people think about doing things like really like every like you said, everyone knows the twin girls in the hallway. Like that's such a thing, you know? Yeah. But but really, it's only used like the one time like they show up in the game room when he first shows up. But I'm saying it's like they don't just like hammer into the fucking ground, you know? And I'm yeah. thinking of, I'm thinking of shit like The Conjuring where they kind of like they're doing this Crooked Man movie or some bullshit, you know, where it's just like the Crooked Man. It's all it's like these iconic scenes, like even when she's running down the hallway and the dudes are, are the, the blowjob scene or whatever that literally like it just happens. And it's like two seconds worth of film. And then that's it. <laughs> and that's so iconic. And people know it so well. And they don't have to shove it down your fucking throat, you know? Well, that, it's yeah. so brilliant. That's the downside of, like, modern horror movies love to fall into the same same pits. Like, it's not just modern. It's it's over the course of all horror, really. There's always this temptation to over-explain shit. The Crooked Man scene where he, like, the dog turns into the Crooked Man and shit... I actually kind of like that. Nobody else seems to, but for me, it was it was cool. The problem I have with it is that you saw it coming a mile away in almost every respect, except for the dog part of it, because they talk about the fucking Crooked Man for about ten minutes. Yeah. Nobody needs to know about the goddamn Crooked Man in advance. You don't have to tell us that those little girls are there. You could just let it happen, and then just let us yeah. deal with it as viewers and be uncomfortable with the not having an explanation. That's part of the horror. So having too much explained, as always, is a huge, huge potential problem. And I think that this movie sidesteps that entirely by giving you absolutely no definitive resolution on anything except for the survival of our characters or non-survival. This is one of those movies that has like, it's got to have the most iconic scenes in it from any movie we've talked about that, that I can think anyways. Like usually there's one or two. Like if you're talking about like a classic horror movie, there's like one or two scenes that you can really reference that everybody would know exactly what you're talking about. This movie has like a dozen, like easily. It's and and like you guys said, they happen like so 
quickly and so flippantly. It's like Kubrick's just pulling gold out of his ass without even like really trying. But didn't they, I, I don't know exactly how long it took to shoot this movie, but didn't they film for like over two years or something crazy like that? Do you how guys could know? they um, with the kid? They, I don't know. No, they, they, they filmed like, they filmed, the, you might be right, but it's like a lot of that's probably more post-production than anything and getting reshoots and things like reshoots, that. Reshoots, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't have that information directly in front of me, but I, I wouldn't doubt it. I know that uh, there's, I have a, another section that I'm calling uh, Here's Johnny Redux and that has everything to do with here's the Here's Johnny scene. And um, basically it took, according to this bit of trivia, it took like a year and a half, like a year to really get it right. <laughs> like to yeah. really like hone in on the, the like, perfect shot or i'm sorry not no i'm sorry i have that backwards i'm looking at the trivia now it was the blood scene that had took like a year for them to get right even though they only did it in three shots which is unheard of for cooper to do that few shots they did it in three shots but they must have tested it for months the blood 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 coming out of the elevator the elevator scene i guess i should say like because he kept saying that doesn't look like blood doesn't look like blood and for me still doesn't but whatever um uh, like I think that's interesting, though, that that well, like people are counting it as a two-year production time for things like that. I don't know if most movies would get that credit. I think it's just the mythos of this film and Kubrick being conditionally satisfied about everything, like completely unsatisfied yeah. all the time with all of his own shows. Do like a hundred takes and crazy shit like that. An and since we're on the... Fucker. Speaking, since we're on the subject, that's a heavy segue to a little side trivia segment that I like to call Stanley Kubrick, a brilliant dickhead. Um, so we're going to go through many, many much trivia bits here about how Stanley Kubrick is an insane person, or was rather, and uh, was probably not a very nice guy. Ready? Fun! Do it. For All right. Despite Stanley Kubrick's fierce demand on everyone, Jack Nicholson admitted to having a good working relationship with him. It was with Shelley Duvall that he was a completely completely different director. He allegedly picked on her more than anyone else, as seen in the documentary Making the Shining and Stanley Kubrick A Life in Pictures. He would really lose his temper with her, even going as far as to say that she was wasting the time of everyone on the set. She later reflected that he was probably pushing her to her limits to get the best out of her, but that she wouldn't, and that she wouldn't trade the experience for anything, but it was not something she ever wished to repeat. Now, building on that, Shelley Duvall suffered from nervous exhaustion throughout filming, including physical illness and hair loss. Jeez, man. Hair loss. If you push your actors to fucking hair loss to get a performance out of them, kind of fuck you. I mean, great film, fuck you. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I think that needs to be said. She uh, is like kind of crazy now, right? Like literally, like she has mental illnesses and stuff going on. I think that's accurate, but I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't have that information. She kind of looks. I've mentioned this in our past viewings before. She kind of looks like Steve Buscemi. She's got bad. Teeth. They, they look like they could be related. Well, it, no, honestly, to me, it's more the eyes. Steve Buscemi's got like those yeah, big, kind of like bulging eyes, and I guess like when she's freaking out, obviously they're more like bold. But like, she like kind of looks like she could be Steve Buscemi's like sister. I don't know. I've always thought that. <clears throat> Building once more on Shelley Duvall. The DVD commentary track for Making the Shining, Vivian Kubrick, reveals that Shelley Duvall received, received, quote, no sympathy at all from anyone on set. This was apparently Stanley Kubrick's tactic in making her feel utterly hopeless. This was most evident in the documentary when he tells Vivian, quote, don't sympathize with Shelley. Kubrick then goes on to tell Duvall, quote, it doesn't help you. No, <laughs> that's so wild. What like, a dick! And, but but also too, like, what cameraman's not gonna be like? I don't know. That, I don't, that's that seems really strange. Like everybody's just gonna treat her like shit just because the director yeah. says treat her like They're, shit. Hey, the director can fire you. That's your boss. Yeah, and you're uh, working in an artistic field where people are supposed to act kind of weird a lot. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh. There were so if many somebody changes. told me to just treat somebody like shit, I'd be, be like, okay. Like, I mean, 
And then I just wouldn't like, oh, yeah. I mean, like worst case scenario, it's just like, you know, when the shoot's done or when you're having lunch or maybe like, hey, what's going on? How's your day? I mean, you can still be a fucking decent human being. Jesus. Christ. Yeah, I mean, the question isn't whether or not you would do it or whether or not people actually did it. I, it sounds like most people did. But the question is or the, the problem is that a director, your boss, told everyone in the office to treat you like shit to make you do better at your job. Yeah, that's uh, it's fucked up. Yeah, I feel you. Um, so she- Shelley Duvall apparently went on Dr. Phil about two years ago, and she was, it was I guess it was, this was like right after Robin Williams committed suicide, and I guess, you know, they were friends, they'd worked together and stuff, and she she was saying stuff like she didn't believe Robin Williams was actually dead, that he was just shape-shifting into different things, and that she also believed she had some sort of worry disc implanted in her body to like make her worry about stuff i don't know. so she's got she's Aww, got some stuff that's a on. bummer yeah shelly we love you she, don't do she, that she's yeah, gotta be like I mean, in, she does man. she's gotta be like getting up there in age though too right she is she was 67 during this interview so i guess yeah. she's like 69 now it's like push pushing 70 yeah Look, I mean, my worry disc is pretty faulty. So, I mean, good for her for having I don't one that give works. Two shit. So. <laughs> yeah, yours is fucked. Um, <laughs> my worry disc is is on the fritz. So, um, here's some more. Uh, that is, that's, that's pretty sad, though. Here's some yeah, more. Stanley sucks. Cooper, a brilliant dickhead. Saul Bass, who all designers in the world probably know. Um, very famous graphic designer, reportedly produced an, around 300 versions of the film's poster before Stanley Kubrick was satisfied. <laughs> Damn. 300. Randy, you're the fucking graphic designer. You imagine, imagine that right now. Take a second that and is, imagine de- developing 300 posters. That's, in my mind, that's professional terrorism. That is as bad as <laughs> telling people to treat like shit at the office. That like three hundred, like poor Saul Bass. For further for 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 knowledge sake, Saul Bass is brilliant, and he like uh uh he's best known for ma- like basically revolutionizing fucking title card sequences in movies. He worked with Hitchcock all the time. He fucking made dozens of logos that are still in use or were used for years and years. The fucking FedEx logo, I think. No, that wasn't him. Sorry, not FedEx. What is? What am I thinking of? Anyway, he's all over the fucking place. He's great. And it hurts my fucking soul to know that somebody as good and talented as him had to go through such hell because of one fucking dickhead artist. Yeah. Well, and here's here's the thing, though. It's like the, like you said, the double-edged sword, kind of. Kubrick was a dick, but it's because he had a vision in his head and knew what perfection would be, knew what it would be like to be. And so that's what he demands. <laughs> and here we are like 30 years later saying like, what a brilliant, amazing film this would be. It wouldn't be it without him, you know? So like, it's like, damn, I, that really does suck that people treat Shelley Duvall like shit. But at the same time, it's like, it's like the art and like, you know, like, I don't know how many how many people are you willing to throw in the volcano for a ha- good harvest? That's yeah. the question you have it's to. Kind of, I mean, kind of, yeah, I mean, it's that like Stanley Kubrick would decided all of them, all yeah. of them can go in the volcano for my good harvest, and like, like the morality of that is what I question. There's a reason that this segment is called "fucking Stanley Kubrick, brilliant dickhead." Well, it's like that. Yeah, it's I've never actually seen it, but it's like the uh, Rob Rob would know. What's that like jazz movie? Rob, the kid, he goes to college and he plays the Whiplash. drums. Yeah. Whiplash. And the dude, he's like a brilliant yeah. teacher and he makes everybody like the best fucking jazz exactly musician right. in the world. But he's like, a huge anxiety. Fan. yeah, see, it's like the same thing, though. It's like, do you want to be like, I guess that's the question, you know, that kind of that it's like. Do you want to be the best? And people are like, yes, I want to be the best or I want to make the best film. And it's like, are you willing to do it? And they say, yes, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. People say that shit all the time. Like they have a drive. They have a push. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. But then it's like, are you really, though? Like, like there's a reason people say that. Like, it's not fucking easy to make perfect art. Okay, but but yes, but also that assumes 
to some extent that you cannot make the movie that you want without being a dickhead. And what are your favorite movies? I'll bet you there's at least one movie that you love that you think is perfect the way it is that has a director that is universally loved. Steven Spielberg is a guy who most people who work with him. No, love uh, yeah, I'm not saying it's like, necessary to make yeah. it. I'm just, I'm just saying so, like, like to me, that's, that's what makes the difference. Like it, it's not a matter of like, if, if, it's not really a question of how many people do you throw in the volcano. It's are you willing to throw people in the volcano to make your good movie? Or are you going to go the the other route and do yeah. it a way that's less direct and have to do it a fucking like, what's your approach? If your approach is being a dickhead, fine. You make the art that's, you make good art, good job, but you're still a dickhead. You're sacrificing something to do that. That's not like moral judgments aside, you're making a sa- the sacrifice of your own personal, like, like morality yeah. in order to make good art it has to be acknowledged <laughs> i think spielberg's a dick actually so if you're wrong is he no I'm oh I, oh i thought you were saying, I was like i'm sure there are people that think so and maybe they can enlighten me i'm more than willing to hear them out on spielberg being a dick stories but uh you know yeah. for my There's knowledge a really great spielberg documentary on hbo that it's like it's pretty long and it's, it, it covers like his entire career I highly recommend you watch it. I think it's just called Spielberg, actually. Super good. Produced by Amblin Entertainment. The the um, chef the chef's name is it's Halloran, right? Scott yes. Scatman's his name. Dude, yeah. Halloran. Uh, dude. <laughs> really quick. <laughs> Yeah. I love this scene of this fucking yeah, me bedroom, too. dude. Me too. <laughs> Interjected into the middle of this movie and also just kind of like his serious disposition throughout it. It like always cracks me up and just and knowing like the things about like Kubrick too, like just it's so it's like a joke, kinda. You know, it's like I don't know. It's somebody a visual su- joke. It's like somebody sure. super serious telling like a totally like subtle joke. And you're <laughs> to where you have to be like, oh, wait, fuck. Did you just tell Actually, a joke? But it's like a really fun. Like, I don't know. I fucking me, love that opposite. bedroom. It's scene. like somebody brilliant. It's like it's like if like the most brilliant fucking professor you have at college or something is giving this amazing lecture and it's like enlightening your world or some shit. And then all of a sudden he makes like a dirty bar joke in the middle of it. (laughs) And that dirty bar joke has never been funnier than in the context of a fucking serious ass classroom. I I don't know. I love that scene. Cause also too, on top of it, the visuals in it are amazing. Like just like the color palette, like it's just like, it's, it's just another, it's an additional scene that's brilliantly shot, but like the context of it and the placement in the film is so wild that it always cracks me up. It's you know, like the slow, slow pan away from his face as he's like chilling on his bed. And then you just see his nudies hanging up on the wall. On both sides. The both it. sides. Yeah. D- Surrounded like the, by nudies. The double dip. It's- it br- it reminds me of your dad too. That's that's kind of the thing too. We always come back to Rob's dad, but it's just kind of that thing, you know. He's like a down to earth, hard working man. He's just chilling in his bedroom, and that's what he likes. He's got the, you know, he, we give a damn to who just comes to put, in and doesn't approve. He's got the the tasteful nudies it, on the wall. To put it in context, Miss uh, Rob's dad uh, recently commented the phrase "atomic dildo" on my Facebook wall and misspelled it, so it says "atomic dido," which is maybe the funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. So this is the man we're, we're comparing to: I "atomic love dido." My <laughs> Man's a genius. Um, Fucking great. Speaking of Scatman, and speaking of <laughs> Stanley Kubrick being a dick, um. Jack Nicholson suggested Scatman Carruthers for this film. Carruthers had a tough time with this movie, with Stanley Kubrick making him do over 100 takes for one scene. Carruthers' next film, Bronco Billy, directed by Clint Eastwood, who's famous for generally only going with one take. Uh, Oh, he was on this movie with Clint Eastwood, who's famous for one take. Carruthers broke down in tears of gratitude on his first scene in the film when he realized he wouldn't have to do endless takes over and over. Damn. This man has a talent for breaking people <laughs> to their core. He, it is, it is like whiplash. It's yeah. like, oh my god, what an asshole! Um, <laughs> brilliant asshole. Um, we should probably get into our ratings. Yeah, <laughs> there's so much yeah. more trivia. I, I imagine it would go on for days. 
Yeah, a... we could make this a four-hour show if we want. Yeah. All right. I, ha- I hate to be to that guy. <laughs> we hate that yeah. you are that guy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I guess let's go ahead and get into our ratings. Uh, Randy, you can kick us off out of five. How do you feel about The Shining? Um, like I said earlier, this this is the one that I go to when people ask me what my favorite horror movie is. Uh, the elevator pitch answer is The Shining. Nobody ever argues with me. Um, <laughs> I've yet to have somebody be like, really? That piece of shit? Like, no, nobody's done that. You're if so you have basic, that sick, Randy. Huh? You're so That's basic. Fine. That's fine. If that means that this is my favorite horror movie, then I'll, I can live with that. Um, you guys can keep fucking fucking Halloween fucking Rob Zombie Halloween if you want. What? Nice. what? <laughs> Favorite movie of all time. No. I, I lo- Sorry. Sorry, my bad. No, I, I think this is a five-star movie if there ever was one. Like, I, I don't... There's not a whole lot that I would change about this because it's a weird alchemy. It's an, a, a miracle that this movie came out as good as it did considering all of the fucking shit that happened behind the scenes with ever like on every level, this should have been a clusterfuck <laughs> and it turned out perfect because of whatever perfect mathematics that went into it to make it what it is. Even the things that might've been imp- like something Kubrick would have considered imperfection. Even the things that were unintentional, despite all of his attempts to be intentional and everything, it all solidifies into this fucking movie that is a cultural icon for a reason. It's effective, it's beautiful, it's well crafted uh, or well well acted, I guess I should say, well acted, well well designed uh, audio design, good audio design. Like on I can't find a negative for it. So it's a five star for me. All right. Juice out of five, how do you feel? Yeah, this movie is fucking brilliant. Um yeah, I mean it's five star. I don't I don't know what else to add. It's just the only thing, like I said personally for me, holy shit, um, is um it really does like it gets under my skin, man. That sound the soundtrack and like the the slow pacing of like some of the shots and stuff like that, it really like it drives me like kind of wild. It's, it's, I don't know. It's hard to explain, but I, I get like a physical reaction from watching this film, but, um, it's, it's brilliant. It's acting is great. The sound is great. The story is great. The shots are great. Everything's fucking great, man. Fucking Grady dropping in bombs. Damn dude. (laughs) No. Yeah. It's like, damn. I forgot. That's the only thing. I always forget about it, too. I'm like, fuck, damn. It's 1980s. Come on now. We're past it. But that character, what he's supposed to be from. Yeah, that's true. How, however, I forget. I forget. 1920. Yeah, Yeah. I guess. Yeah, I guess that's a good point. But yeah. um, But five star for sure. No, no doubt can't even can't even go higher for the yabos you know it's just it's top top notch <laughs> yeah, 5.5 5. I, I meant to ask you earlier and we got sidetracked i um, knew you so would i know i already you, know what the question is <laughs> do, you, do you still as, get a half star for all rotten yabos as oh, the scene was happening as the scene was happening i was like rob is literally going to ask me about this <laughs> <laughs> the yabos math you make the rules man i don't make the rules uh, it's I don't know, but you also get the bedroom yabos too, which they're they're photo yabos. So I don't know, yeah. I don't you know. Get, we haven't really young, you get younger woman yabos before yeah, they, they go rot. Yeah, that's the thing. Rot, yeah, yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? Why? Maybe, okay. Maybe maybe it's a wash. Maybe it's a wash. <laughs> yeah, you maybe can't go higher than important. five star, anyways. <laughs> a man's got a code, Randy. <laughs> oh my god. Andy. Oh shit. I'm giving this a five star as well. I don't have anything negative to say about it, really at all. Uh, among the many iconic classic scenes we already talked about, we didn't even mention like the whole red rum scene. Uh, we did. We didn't really talk about the old lady until just now, which is another like crazy iconic scene, like the whole room two thirty two thirty seven spiel. It's just like. This movie's gorgeous. Like Kubrick was a photographer, so like. Obviously, he's got an eye 
Um, and he uses it, man. He fucking uses it throughout this whole movie. It's just, you could put this on mute and just watch it in awe. And that, that's my favorite part about this fucking movie. And that's what eventually, like, got me into it. Because, like, like I said, it took me a few times to watch it to, before I, like, really enjoyed it. And for whatever reason, like, I didn't really care about the family dynamic. And I was watching, like, an old DVD copy. It didn't really look that good. And I was like, I like Jack Nicholson's performance, but beyond that, that was it. And I was like, you know, it's just not enough for me. And then I got a copy on Blu-ray and I watched it on like my parents' 60 inch TV. And like, I just fell through the screen immediately. And that was like the first time I was like, holy shit, this man, this, it's gorgeous. It's like a fucking work of art. Like I finally kind of got what everybody was talking about. It's, um, it's great, man. I just love the look of this thing. It's a, obviously our aggregate's going to be a five. Um, I got nothing negative to say. Uh, let's go ahead and get into our Rotten Tomatoes segment and see what everybody else our thinks. Rotten Yabo segment. <laughs> Take it away, Juice. Randy, don't treat the Yabos like that. Come on now. <laughs> don't blame um, me. Blame Coop. <laughs> Um, all right, let's go around the room. This will be uh, interesting uh, between the uh, critics and the audience score for such a classic. But it's a horror classic, so you never know where people are going to fall, you know? Um, yeah. So let's find out. Let's start with the critics. We have 73 critic reviews counted. Um, let's see, this movie is from 1980. They did not have Rotten Tomatoes back then, so I'm not really sure... Mm -hmm from whence these reviews were counted, but let's see if we can guess anyway. So let's start with Bob. What do you think The Shining got from the critics, Bob? I'm going to go with an 85. 85. Randy, where are you going to take it? Um, it really kind of depends on how many were from the years, like early years of this. And I really like without knowing that, I would just wager a guess. That it's maybe half of them? I don't know. That might be... I don't know. I'm going to go with 75. We'll just see 75. 75, okay. Bob's going to take it. Uh, first of all, it is certified fresh. So The Shining, of course. That's, it would be ridiculous if it wasn't. But um, Bob almost nailed it. Uh, it's 86% with an average Damn. rating of 8.4 out of 10. So those are pretty like locked in too, which is not always the wow. case. Of the 73 critic reviews counted, 63 are fresh, 10 are rotten. The critic consensus is, though it deviates from Stephen King's novel, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining is a chilling, often baroque journey into madness, exemplified by an unforgettable turn from Jack Nicholson. Sure. I don't know why yeah. they need to even bring up Stephen King in that. This is so yeah. its own thing to me. It really, yeah, it really is, yeah. And the only thing I would say about this movie and Stephen King is there are things like I watch it knowing that it's a book and knowing that like maybe the room is explored more in the book, like or what? Why is it that room or you know things like that? And so and. It doesn't bother me because this movie is like brilliant on its own. But I mean, I guess that's the only thing, you know, when you're tied to a work like that and you're going to allude to things that people are just going to assume are explored more in a, you know, in a written piece, then, you know, <laughs> I guess it's hard to stand completely on your own. Cause... I don't know, man, because this I've s I haven't read the book, but I have seen Stephen King's The Shining, the the miniseries uh -huh. that came out some years ago. And that that's supposed to be like pretty spot on to Stephen King's original work. Uh -huh. And man, the it doesn't add a whole lot. Like okay. it doesn't add. A, there's not a lot of things that aren't explained that are. Even if I wanted that, it's not really so much that. There's a little bit of that, but really, it's more of just it's a different dynamic of the family, and it's okay. not as interesting of one for me. Like like it doesn't help that it's you know not directed by a photographer, like by by somebody with the eye of Kubrick. Yeah. But uh, setting directed that by aside, Meg Garris. Yeah. <laughs> and setting that aside, it's. I don't want to watch it's, that. I don't know. It's like the way I it ends. I recommend it. It's not bad. It's not bad. Uh, it's like just it. not to me. It. it it's a tough. It's following maybe the toughest act you have to follow, yeah. with yeah, with like an entirely different feel. Basically, for for my money, it's entirely different, and I don't particularly 
care for it by comparison. But that said, you can't compare them. Yeah, it's it's just they're just so different. It's unfair. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, even if you do it, like you can say one is better than the other, and I do. But it's they're very different, and they can stand. They can stand in their own little alleyways of the same corridor. You know, they they can be twins yeah. in the in the corridor. Okay. They, um, it's definitely made for TV, and you can tell. I, I, there's a much slower descent into madness for Jack and the made for TV one, and it's also like there's like this whole thing in the book where like the boiler is some sort of metaphor for Jack's character, and that plays a much bigger role in the made for TV version as well. And there's, I, I do like it a lot, and I recommend watching it for sure. But there's this one scene where like there's a, there's like these shrubs that are like shaped into animals on the front lawn in front of the hotel and then they come to life and like start chasing people around and it's like horrible cheap cg bushes chasing people oh it's god awful that's the one thing that i can't that's straight from the book about. too oh, oh, yeah that's so dumb man they, that, they, there was no hedge maze in the book it's all those fucking things uh huh interesting that's as hedge i understand maze, much better yeah, it also is. It's like thematically more appropriate. Yeah. Just saying. All right. Well, let's get into our audience score. There is a large user rating on this one. Four hundred eighty thousand people have rated this on Rotten Tomatoes under the audience score. So let's flip it. Let's let Randy go first on the audience score. Randy. Um, ninety. 90, Bob. 86. 86. Randy's going to take it away. This Randy. is a 93%. Nice. So, mm. certified, fresh, all around for show. The Shining. Um, I'm a little surprised at the critics at the 86, but um, let me see maybe what a negative. Uh, shock yeah. effect. Shock Let's do effect. That. And graphic imagery don't compensate for the sense of pointlessness and even distaste that is left at the end of the movie. Rating two out of four. Fuck yeah, what's you, the point in Ernest. telling any story? <laughs> Ernest. What's the point in telling stories, guys? Come on, let's Ernest. just jerk each other from, up all day. From the New York Daily News, you dumb piece of shit. <laughs> 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 you ignorant slut. <laughs> Straight chilling podcast here to tell you that your reviews are stinkers. <laughs> We're starting beef with fucking Ernest. All right. Fuck uh, you, Ernest. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the end of our Rotten Tomato segment. We, we've got enough beef going around. We'll keep it at one for today. No, no need to read any more we're Rotten just, We're reviews. just a straight up. Just call us Arby's because we're serving the beef around here. <laughs> the sloppiest beef. <laughs> Sloppy we have ass the meats. beef. We have the meats. That's yeah, for, for fucking sure. <laughs> you know, fucking Arby's uh, is the sloppiest shit I've ever seen, dude. <laughs> <laughs> if Arby's was a person, it would be a guy with an un half untucked shirt and a mustard stain <laughs> all the way down. <laughs> sloppier, dude. So it's something he's I don't know, something sloppier, but just on up, point. Hey, he needs he needs a couple more D he's like really he's a, sweaty too. He's just like it, Yeah, he's sweaty, <laughs> but he also has like a like one of those like a child has Kool-Aid ring of dirt around him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's better. Yeah. <laughs> Sloppy. Ooh. That's, our, that's that's Mr. Arby. You don't need to go hang out with Mr. Arby. <laughs> Arby's gave me food poisoning a few Thanksgivings ago, and I was just... <laughs> and a partridge in a shitting, fucking pear tree. Shitting and puking my brains out for two days straight. It was a fucking nightmare. That sucks on Thanksgiving, You know, too. I, yeah, I, I remember that promotion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll I'm, clean you out. Every 20, every 20 guests gets salmonella. It's our Willy Wonka. Hey, you know what we gotta do? We gotta talk about the Cooter of the Week. Who the fuck is the cooter of the week? In that wheel. Cooter of the week. I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's like two, three characters in this movie. Um, yeah. I mean, Jack is, he's got, he's got some cooter tendencies going on, but I don't know if he qualifies enough no. to be a full cooter. No, he's yeah. not a cooter and there's nobody else. <laughs> he's the only one there's... that picks up the radar slightly to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
What about a, a ghost cooter, Grady? Oh, Got Grady it. dropping in bombs. Mm. Oh, we don't yeah, get he enough. Seems to be manipulative. Yeah, he, but we don't get enough of him. I mean, he's, he's manipulative, but he dresses nice and he sounds awesome. His, like, yeah, I corrected. All him. Right. he's yeah. very convincing. <laughs> His manipulation about, is on point. What about old Rotten Yabo's ghosty? Sexual well, she's aliens, a... manipulation. Maybe the whole uh, hotel manipulation. Is the... I think the whole hotel yeah. might be our best candidate for for Cooter. That's the, true. the first inanimate object <laughs> as the cooter. We talked about this at one point. Can an object be a cooter? It's at the know. hotel. <laughs> well, it obviously has a will. It has a will and Dude, a presentation. It was I, built on an Indian burial ground. I wish yeah. the the thing that would really push the hotel to be a cooter, I wish this were the case, is if you guys were talking about it had some special hedges that were cut up like animals, but if it had like some yabos like hedges or something like that, then we could definitely we could definitely stick it with the cooter tag. But well, it's got furries <laughs> giving blowjobs. Yeah, it's got it blowjobs furries, and it's it got rotten yabos, and it's got I don't know, it's got murdered little children. I mean, that's pretty that's yeah. pretty fucked up. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. If we're gonna go that, if we if we yeah. gotta label something, I think it's it'd certainly be the, most... the the most. It's the closest object that's ever <laughs> come close yeah. to a cooter title. I don't know if there'd be another one, but I yeah, I guess. <laughs> I don't, don't want to taint I our feel data, like... you know. I mean, it's precious, and we gotta do our <laughs> we gotta do it's our co- we gotta do we can mention this as like an outlier in in our cooter episode, our dedicated cooter it, episode, but it's a cooter artifact. <laughs> should uh, should we take a minute to remind everyone what a cooter is, just in case they're unaware? <laughs> oh, First I don't know if we thing. can. I think I think if you if you want to be a cooter hunter, if you want to know the deets, if you want to get in on it, you got to hit us up on the Slack channel. We've got a dedicated cooter tab there. So I mean, it really, I don't I don't think we can get into it on the case. It's too much to cover. It's too much. If you're but, wondering what a cooter is, do not look it up on the internet, for you will come up empty. We are pioneering this research, and you need to come directly to the horse's mouth. And we are that horse's mouth. So we come have, to our you, Slack channel. Come to our you Slack gotta, channel, get on that cooter tab, and we'll talk all about it. You got to give them at least the, the four points, the four categories in which we Yeah, score. so we, what are we at grading now? We're, we're grading on manipulation. Yeah. Appearance. Appearance. Yeah. Sexual mm-hmm. deviancy. Yeah. And There's we always forget else. the fourth one. We always, I think we even had five at one point. We but... always forget it. Well, we had talked about overall kind of shittiness. Oh, yeah, I think like, like deserving of death, point. being deserving of, of murder. <laughs> or like... How do we always forget this last one? Uh, Hang on. I have the chart starred on my thing, so let me just pull it up real quick. We are I... the best researchers you know. <laughs> We're computers. We've come a long way in building the Cooter profile. <laughs> Yes, but, but we've learned nothing. There's four points. I don't know. The hotel could hit some of those, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. I don't know I about mean, the appearance because it's got no, some. some the appearance flag. is dope. Yeah, the fucking yeah. carpet and that uh, that ballroom or what? Not uh, the gold room or that dude. That shit is swanky as fuck. The fucking golden ballroom. Man. Yeah. I, I went to the Stanley Hotel this year, uh, just oh, for a few minutes, slut. which is what inspired the book. Um, and I almost ordered a drink at the bar, but I had to drive out, so I couldn't do that. Oh, but Randy. it's fucking, it's not, it's not as open and big as this studio was that they, they filmed in. Um, so it's not as like, like, I don't know. It doesn't have the vaulting ceilings quite so high or anything like that, but it is fucking awesome anyway. Like it is very much like a, an, like an old, like spooky hotel, although they, Obviously maintain it very well, and they've actually put in a hedge maze to because very people nice. fucking movie so much, and it's about hip high right now. So go hip check it out. Nice. Can yeah. you stay there? You can. You stay can stay there. there. Yeah, they've they've actually expanded with like four or five other buildings too. But we walked mostly through the main building, and they let you look around. They have a little store where you can buy shit that says Red Rum for too much money. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Red Rum for too, for much, too money. much money. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. I think, think, Rob, you said they were putting in a horror museum there at some point, right? I don't, that's not come to fruition as far as I could tell. But Yeah, that's what I heard, which 
I don't know. I kind of, that sounds cool enough, but I kind of hope they keep it a hotel because I really would like I don't to go there and stay. I I don't think that they're not going to have people staying there. They have too many fucking hotel rooms there now. They have like yeah, five, like I said like five buildings total, I think. And it's like in Damn. a beautiful location. Yeah, it's in Estes Park in Colorado. It's fucking gorgeous, and I, it would be foolish of them to not let people stay there anymore. But I'm sure they'll just, you know, probably I don't know, turn some conference room into a fucking museum room or some shit. Okay, let's. Uh, Juice, did you find that other one? That other point, dude. I'm still looking. All right. Well, whatever. Cooters. Look them up We're, by coming to our Slack channel. I don't know how we have let this happen. We'll, uh, <laughs> reach out, we'll get back reach to, out to us, and we'll get you on our Slack, and you can ask us directly, and Justin will get his shit together. I got it. Time. Smug arrogance, motherfucker. Uh, the arrogance. Dude, Grady's arrogance. arrogant. Grady's arrogant. He's a, he's a cocky I'm mother. sorry to differ with you, sir. Smug, and I... What he, I took care of it or whatever. You knew I it. corrected them. I corrected, and then he was like, "We don't think your heart's in it, Mister." <laughs> like he's like, you know. Well, I guess that's kind of manipulation, manipulation. but he's got yeah. some arrogance. Old Grady, he might be the closest. He's dropping the n bombs. He does look swanky though, so he doesn't hit that point. He doesn't hit the attire. Smug arrogance, manipulation, sexual deviancy, attire, and maybe like a ghost point of overall shittiness. Ghost shit. Ghost, <laughs> Ghost, Ghost shit. All right, let's go ahead and round the show out with a bit of horror news. We got a trailer for a new movie that is being produced by Mr. James Gunn. You know, the man that got fired by Disney. That's and stuff pedophile. And things. A man oh, after God. Rob's own heart. God damn. Oh my God, dude. Um, <laughs> don't start that shit. This movie's called Brightburn. <laughs> I don't want that to be a fucking ongoing joke. That's not a good one. The movie's <laughs> called Bright Burn. It's going to be directed by David Yaravesky, who has previously directed The Hive. Um, produced by Gunn. It's going to be starring Elizabeth Banks. It's going to be hitting the theaters uh, May 24th, 2019. Uh, this trailer looks interesting. What did you guys think about it? Dude, this is a Superman horror film. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's some Kal El shit for sure. I mean, and we like they're not hiding it. In fact, yeah. some of some of the shots in this trailer directly mimic and even the soundtrack mimic like some recent DC stuff, like whether it be like the shots of Superman and Injustice or like the Man of Steel like trailers and shots. Like it's directly mimicking that. Like Do we think <laughs> I don't know. I feel like this is I know this isn't the case, but my mind immediately was like, went into Cloverfield mode. I was like, is this like some subversive entry into the DC universe where it's like Earth 2113 or something variation? And instead of fucking Kal-El being, coming Superman, he becomes, I don't know, it, it turns out to be a uh, Grodd or, or not Grodd, excuse me. Um, what's that oh, fucker's name? Yeah, like the ant, like the rever- uh, Bizarro yeah. or something. Yeah. What, what is, uh, whatever, but. Uh, you get the idea. Like, I'm, yeah. I was wondering if maybe it was some like entry into a big sweeping DC storyline, the way that Marvel introduced Infinity Gauntlet, but not not using the same methods. Instead, using a Cloverfield method of sneaking it in. Well, and they're also doing that Joker movie, which is like really dark and's got Joaquin Phoenix in it. So, I yeah. mean, they might just be like, they might have like tried their hand at like the universe and like bombed and been like fuck it let's just do wild shit <laughs> i mean which i would be down for because that i like i'm I'd super prefer, intrigued yeah. from the joaquin phoenix like joker movie because it's they're like eh, it's like its own thing they're not trying to like build anything off of it and if they made like a horror superman movie that would be cool <laughs> like i don't know but what right. do we think about it not being Superman? Like, obviously, it, I mean, it's obviously Superman. Is well, let's just assume that it's not related, though. Yeah, direct, not, not, completely not intellectual unrelated. property related. Like, if that's the case, what do we think of it? Because I don't like, mm. I don't have a big issue with it. Because I mean, horror movies I, have built out of samey, <laughs> like, yeah, they pulled out of similar wells from other other stuff before. Well, and the th- the fact that it's not intellectually like linked, if it wasn't, and I'm just assuming that it's not, obviously. But um, 
that's fine with me because I am interested in seeing a Superman horror movie. So if they can get away with that, I'm fine with that. If he's if his name isn't Sue, like he's drawing this weird design. Like if that were, he's wearing a red cape. He like it's the he's wearing a red cape. It's like he's it's, wearing a red cape and a mask, but it's a red cape. And he has the powers. He flies. Yeah. He's fast. He's, he's got rural heat vision. American town. <laughs> he's got heat vision and Jack. But um, his ship is in a barn. I mean, it's it's that, fucking Superman. It's, it's, that is fucking Superman. It's fucking Superman. Like I don't I don't know how you like. I don't think I don't even think they're like, like you said. I don't think they're bothering to hide it. No, they're just and James saying Gunn what it. producing it is also really intriguing too because he got fired from Marvel and he's always been like a quirky kind of guy. And he got picked up by DC. I think he signed on to do the next Suicide Squad. So even like just like oh, yeah. throwing his name on there, like oh, produced by Jane, it makes me think like, well, like what the fuck, like what's going on here? I don't know. I and you know, I haven't me, done like, any research into like what studio is or like I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't either. And and the thing so, I don't. I don't really okay. Well, Warner Brothers does DC, so like that's the thing. I don't really care if like it's tied in any way to like an existing like it's su- it is Superman. <laughs> that's the thing. It's I don't I don't care either. Like it's I don't I don't even honestly like I want I would like it obviously to be good. I'd rather it be there be more good movies than bad. But to me, it just kind of like it doesn't excite me. Like I don't really care about seeing a an evil Superman story because I've seen it because I've read comics before. So, I mean, Nerd. to me, like as a, as a horror, I mean, sure, we can give it a shot. I don't have a problem with that. I would prefer that it not be intellectually linked, although I do think that's an interesting idea. I don't actually think that it would be to the benefit of this movie to be intellectually linked to anything where that has baggage like that. I so agree, yeah. for me, it's like, you know, it, to me, it's just like any other movie that I don't really care that much about and might be good, might be bad, but we'll find out. Like, I don't I don't have a strong supposition about it beyond that. Yeah, well, I know there's just a couple of things that makes it intriguing just from a horror fan standpoint and just kind of like a movie fan standpoint and just in general is I know like New Mutants was got pushed back and it's going to drop and everybody was teasing that like, oh, that was going to be like a horror themed like super movie and then we've started getting movies like Deadpool which is an R-rated you know superhero movie which makes a lot of money and at the same time um you've had like Halloween fucking make a ton of movie these uh, it make a ton of movie the nun and the conjuring and all that I mean a ton, a ton of, of money. money oh my god <laughs> thank you thank you a ton of money so I like the idea not just like oh let's make superhero movies horror that'll work too or i like the idea of these like genre bending like people willing to take more risk outside of what people would think would be acceptable or would make money or would be pro you know like i i'm intrigued by that idea that somebody would be like fuck it let's make a superman horror movie because look at all these because it can be profitable because look at all these other things that you know oh, horror's not profitable or R-rated superhero movies aren't profitable like I like that idea that people <laughs> would like would be willing to take more chances and be We're, able to like kind of genre bend in that way I think we full on entered the what if stage of movie comic book movies where that is possible or like you said uh, with comics for a long time, they kind of like Spider-Man was Spider-Man, fucking Superman was Superman, and you had their main storylines. Eventually, they started having like spectacular Spider-Man and fucking amazing Spider-Man and all these different ver- yeah, like variations. the noir Batman, they could, where it's like yeah, 19, they could have twenties and shit. Yeah, yeah, you could have like Ga- Gotham Gaslight and shit like that. Yeah, and you and have what ifs like in the I think nineties, the what ifs started happening where it's like what if Hulk was actually not Bruce Banner, it was. Lex Luthor or some yeah. shit like and or what if <laughs> S- Superman met Captain America like you could just do <laughs> we're entering that phase in comic book or in uh, comic book movies now where those m- people will throw money at that because the regular ho- superhero movies while still profitable are becoming stayed and uh, repetitious at this point so they might who knows like it's like the split and 
Glass, those movies, like those aren't obviously from existing properties, but the way that those were done, like, were was successful. The way that it was like subversively a sequel to a movie yeah. that nobody, everybody had like long since forgotten or not not been paying attention to for some time. I don't know. I think anything's possible with these intellectual properties. They're being more daring with them because I think people are becoming bored enough with the original intellectual property that they're okay with with put adding a twist of some kind. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a Gotham by Gaslight movie next for Batman. Like a next standalone Batman movie probably is going to have some crazy twist like that. Yeah, and I honestly I'd be fine with it at this point cuz like you said like it's getting to the point like okay, we saw like Infinity War and like I like those movies and stuff, but it's like you can't keep it going for it. Like I like yeah, I would I'm I would be, dumb with it after that. yeah, I would be more interested now in seeing like I don't have to see Ben Affleck be fucking Batman out of time. Like I don't like grab a dude, make Gotham by Gaslight, make a fucking so- Superman horror movie. Like that's cool. Like I don't know. I I'm down with that. People, I'm down that people at I'm down with the idea that big ass studios that aren't known for taking risk would be willing to risk those kind of things because I think those movies would could be interesting to watch and if they're given the freedom and the budgets to do it then they could be really good like interesting films they're like there's no there, people are getting less and less thrilled from the synergy of having multiple movies with different names that also tie <laughs> in again. Like people don't, people like we've seen uh, Spider Man, some owned by another studio, go to fucking Marvel Studios and be in the new Marvel, and they're everybody's making money or whatever. People are now in we're in a post Spider Man cross studio world <laughs> where people aren't going to be shocked if suddenly Deadpool showed up at least as like a a reference or something in one of the new Marvel movies, probably not Avengers, maybe not anytime soon, who knows? But, like, it wouldn't be that shocking anymore, so the way to shock people now, or the way to get people intrigued now, is by saying, like, is doing the opposite, and saying, like, this is a standalone movie about uh, evil Superman. Yeah. (laughs) Like, uh, this is, if Superman actually wasn't Bruce Banner, or whatever, Kal-El, but was whatever, like, the evil version of him was, not Khan, but... For whatever that guy was in the, in you're the mixing all kind of. Things. I can't yeah. think of his fucking name, and it's driving me let's, nuts. Lex Luthor, Bruce on. Banner. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I know. Keep, keep trucking, keep trucking, keep an eye out for that shit. Come May 24th, 2019. I'm sure we'll be talking about it. Uh, there is a, another film coming out that's going to be part of that Into the Dark series on Hulu. It's so what they've been doing is these these have been coming out the first Friday of every month. They're, um, since the next one coming out is going to be a New Year's-related movie, they're going to release it a little early. It's going to be dropped on December 28th, so you can watch it before New Year's. Uh, it's um, The plot centers on a group of old high school friends who reunite in a house for New Year's Eve where they're forced to confront traumas from their past. Uh, it's starring, it's an all-female cast, apparently. It's going to be starring Suki Waterhouse, which she was in The Bad Batch. She's the main chick from The Bad Batch, mm. um, which the we talked about. Terrible. Not a great movie, <laughs> but I thought she did a really good job. She, yeah, she, not, I, yeah, not her fault. I enjoyed her. Uh, it's directed by Sophia Tikal. Uh It's going to be called New Year, New You. Oh, so, I saw that trailer, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, like I said, they're they're three for three in my opinion. So I'm I'm excited to to see this next one. Man, I hope they're all, you know, good. Are they all full length like, movies? Yeah, they're all around 80, 90 minutes. So they're so far, anyways, they have been. Yeah. All right. It's like a a new feature a, a month. I don't know if I can get Hulu here. Shutter needs to get on the stick and get their dicks into fucking South Korea quick. <laughs> Who doesn't? Fuck South Korea <laughs> with your dick, Whoa, Shutter. Bob. No, I meant that's exactly what Bob. 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 Uh, that's Bob, what Bob. Uh, we're All mixing right. For us. The, the last bit of news we have, which we we have talked about this before, but I wanted to bring it up again because everybody knows that uh, Bobby Bibbs is one of our favorite people. On the face of the earth right now. Joey by Bobby, Bobby Bibbs. Bibbs. By Bobby Bibbs, I mean Joe Bob. Joe Bob Briggs. Richard Bibbs. My boy Rich. Dick Rich. Bibbs. Dick Bibbs. <laughs> yeah. 
So he's returning Friday, December 21st uh, with his A Very Joe Bob Christmas. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He's going to be showing four movies, all from a single franchise. Um, and uh, I guess it's going to represent the, quote, spirit of the drive-in Christmas. <laughs> so it starts at 9 o'clock, right. four movies so, back to back. So excited. I I'm, am. I'm fucking I'm very stoked excited. for it, too. Because there is... He's got, like... He's got a little trailer, a short little trailer you can watch where he talks about it. And just just listening to that man say anything is joyous for whatever Wait, reason. what night is it? What night December is it? December 21st. Fucking shit. It's the night yeah, you're before. traveling, aren't you? Yeah, I'll be flying through the air with the greatest of ease. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Swag um, brag. <laughs> yeah. Um, Swag. I'm pretty excited. There is... I, to my knowledge, there is no Christmas horror franchise that exists outside of, well, at least not in that quantity, quantity, uh, besides Silent Night, Deadly Night, which is the first one is like one of, is a must watch every year for me. I fucking adore oh, yeah. that. And uh, I at first assumed that they were just leaving off Silent Night 5, but I don't think that's the case anymore because. Silent Night 2 is like 50% of it is footage from Silent Night 1, Silent Night, Deadly Night 1. So I think they might just gloss over Silent Night, Deadly Night 2, which is kind of a shame. I had this, okay, so I had this exact same thought and I was going to bring it up. So there's, yeah, there's five Silent Night movies. They're only showing four. What I thought he was going to do is skip over four and just go straight to five because four is like damn near unwatchable. It's, I don't even remember rough. what four is. You don't think he's gonna do like he's gonna throw Black Christmas in there or anything? No, no, all he's from all from franchise. one franchise. Oh, oh, I'm not paying attention. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. That's the one with. Oh, it's got fucking Clint uh, Howard in it. I don't holy remember this one. That's not good. To hear Bibbs talk about and host that second one. Holy fucking great. I kind of would to know more about I think they might gloss it though. And honestly, I I would be I would be happier if they glossed four, because I don't remember shit about four. But I know that five has Mickey Rooney in it, and there's some interesting shit about him like straight up lobbying against the original Silent Night Deadly yeah. Night film because he didn't three, like three three is insane. Like yeah. so I, I feel like it's one, a, two, three are a lock. And then it's like, are they going to do four or five? I think skipping four would be preferable to me anyways. Just yeah, five. actually, four, you might be right, because four, I'm, I'm just now remembering it from looking at Google Image Search, four is one that literally has almost nothing to do with Christmas. It's the Christmas one with the bugs, right? Yeah, there's Weird a bug bugs. coming out of a woman's mouth, and then there's like <laughs> a dude with a dick nose, and like, yeah, I think you might be right about that. I'd love it. I think you might be. Yeah. We, yeah, it's got like nothing to do with Christmas. And to be fair, part three has essentially nothing to do with Christmas either. It looks like it's shot in the middle of fucking summer. If I remember <laughs> so did the second one. The extra, yeah. Yeah. The yeah. extra Except 15 for the minutes footage. of footage. <laughs> yeah, the new footage, yeah. And all the new footage looked like it was filmed in Burbank. Um, Which, to be fair, like when you got such a low budget and you want to release a movie around Christmas, like you got to film that shit like in the summer. <laughs> Island Night 3 is the one where a guy has a dome for a head and you can see his brain. His brain, yeah. He looks like, an, he looks like a, a member of Devo or some shit. Was it Krug? Is that the character from Ninja Turtles? <laughs> Krang? Krang. 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 I'm an old man now. That's all I can just, say. Just call me Krug. <laughs> There's a really funny joke from 30 Rock that I always remember about Krang, where the dudes, they're, they're like always trying to write in a joke about Krang, and she's like, stop trying to write in Krang. Nobody knows Krang. <laughs> <laughs> and that is clear by Bob's. <laughs> yeah. I know so, yeah. not by I, oh, and. <laughs> Unless Joe Bob found some other franchise that I am unaware of, that's got to be what's happening. And I, I don't honestly, I, I can live with anything as long as I get that first one. Yeah, yeah, I'd be down with that. And in, in his little promo that you can watch, he says straight up that the movies don't make a lick of sense. So I mean, yep. come on, come on, it's gotta, it's gotta be. Yeah, 
That's pretty funny. That's yeah. That second one. Oh my god. Shameless. I gotta shameless. live tweet that shit while I'm flying. I didn't believe well, in Santa. Sorry. Broke into Silent Night Deadly Night 2 talk. That's it for the news. That's going to be it for us this week here at Straight Chilling HQ. We're going to be back next week with another movie, as always. Uh, this is going to be our last Patreon pick for the year. Um, so a quick shout out to our Patreon patron, Matthew. Thank you for supporting the show, man. Uh, also, the Matthew, man who coined Soul Juice Stain. So, man, the guy it. really contributes to this guy. It's really taking us to the next <laughs> level. I need to ask him <laughs> if he legit just thought you were saying Soul Juice when you were saying Soju, or if, is, if it came from somewhere else. I don't know. Just, I think he's just, just he's brought it up some, either on the Slack or on Insta, I, maybe Instagram. He's brought it up before, like recently. Yeah. And I think he's just, it's the minute, but we can we can ask him. To clarify. Anyway, Matthew chose Jacob's Ladder. So we're going to be talking about Jacob's Ladder yes. next week. Uh, we only got three shows left in the year. It's getting down to the wire. Getting down to the wire, boys. Uh, so until next week, as always, you can rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. We love getting those ratings and reviews because they help people find us that don't know we exist. It should help more than you realize. So if you're um, unable to support us financially, that's a really quick, easy, free way to support the show, help people find us. Just drop us a rating and a review on iTunes, and may God bless you. Bless your soul. <laughs> you can also okay. find us Took a turn on Instagram. There. <laughs> I pray for you, brother. Um <laughs> You can find us on Instagram at Straight Chilling Podcast. We're on Twitter at str8 underscore chilling. You can send us an email through our website, straightchillingpodcast.com. And if you want to hit us up on Slack, just let, let us know. Contact us on any one of those social media platforms I just mentioned and say, hey, I'd like to join you on Slack. I'll send you a link so you can do so. We talk about fun shit all week, every week. Join the party. In fact, this week, um, uh, I'm going to post some more Shining trivia on there, I think, because there's cool. so damn much of it. We need to have a Patreon bonus episode just covering fucking Shining trivia. We really could. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, we already posted the uh, the the Patreon bonus episode of you talking about Halloween again. Halloween 2018. Oh, how again. intriguing. So that actually, I don't <laughs> even think I mentioned that on the show since I posted it. Yeah. If you want to hear Justin rant and rave about Halloween 2018 for another drunkenly, person, it's, it's drunkenly rant and rave. Yeah. It's posted on our Patreon website. Hop on there, put Justin in your ears, get a little soul juice action. <laughs> <laughs> you know you want it. Just let uh, your soul juice. Go on. Yeah. I think that's it. That's it for my rant. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Jacob's Ladder next week. Until always, all you mother truckers, please keep chilling. Naughty. Ooh, long episode. Yeah, it was long. That was long. Um, it's an 